So what we're going to dive into now is, is um, metabolite identification and quantification. Um, this is uh, also called metabolite annotation, and it's actually the probably the biggest bottleneck in, in metabolomics, at least as it, as it refers to from the informatics side. So again, every slide uh, set begins with our learning objectives. So we're going to look at the three main technologies. We're going to look at NMR, GCMS, and LCMS. And in all cases, we're going to look at what I call deconvolution, spectral deconvolution. So you have this complex collection of peaks, some of which are overlapping. Uh, they're separated by time or retention time, retention index, um, or they're separated by chemical shift. And um, we're going to show you the principles of how these uh, deconvolution steps are done, uh, how uh, individual compounds are identified and then quantified for each of those technologies. And then we're going to close off about some of the different types of uh, mass spectral database searches and some of the types of, of mass spec databases and also NMR databases as well, I think. So you've seen this slide before, uh, and so this is the, the concept of metabolite annotation. <coughs> so it's a bunch of spectra or single spectra, and what you're trying to do is put names to every peak, compound names to every peak, and intensities or concentrations. So in this case it's a list of concentrations is ultimately what we'd like. Um, and it it's, can be done either through targeted or untargeted metabolomics. This is the still the final objective, that's the, the point. Now when you compare metabolomics to some of the other fields like genomics or proteomics, historically with genomics we had things like um, databases like GenBank, tools like BLAST, um, which allowed us to take sequence data and instantly identify which gene we're working with or which related set of genes we're working with. Um, with transcriptomics, we could also go up and look at databases as well, which would convert the intensities, then the, the marker or identifiers that tell us which gene we're talking about. Um, so there were online tools for that. In the field of proteomics, um, there's programs, tools, web servers like Mascot, which allows you to take lists of peaks, uh, enter them, press go, and you're going to get information about which peptides, which proteins, uh, and then again, based on their intensity, you get some indication of their relative concentrations. Historically, with metabolomics, um, you know, you can come up with your chromatogram or your NMR spectrum or your mass spectrum, and there really wasn't a place to go. Um, people still, uh, today even, manually go through peaks, peak sets, and, and match and fit and look up handmade tables to identify things. Um, so this as I say, historically was a problem, but I think what we're going to try and show you today, and, and some of you obviously know as well, there are now tools, resources, databases, um, web servers that allow you to do this. But that's, this historically was the problem with metabolomics. Now the other part to, to metabolomics is something I've hinted at before, um, which is this difference between the, the known compounds and the unknown compounds. And um, the, the term has evolved over the years to something we call known unknowns and unknown unknowns. And, and this is a, from a quote from Donald Rumsfeld, I think, in 2001 when he was talking about um, <coughs> Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda. And, and he's, people were asking, well, how do you deal with all this stuff? And he said, well, there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know that there are some things that we do not know. But then there are also unknown knowns. The ones that we don't know that we don't know. And so this represents essentially the compounds, the dark matter of mass, spec of mass spectrometry and metabolomics. There are lots of things we just don't know that, because we just don't know them. So in the case of metabolite identification, um, we might have a spectrum, and it might be from blood, or it might be from urine, it might be from some other well-characterized biofluid. And for the vast majority of the peaks that we're going to look at, um, or maybe not, 
at least with say NMR or GCMS, um, those peaks are in some existing database. Those compounds are known. Uh, it's just for us at the time, we don't know what they are and our challenge is to identify them. But then as we go up to LCMS, where there's 30, 20,000 features, we will only know a fraction about them anywhere from 2 to 5 percent. The other 95 to 98 percent are the unknown unknowns. Um, they aren't in any database. People still haven't characterized them. There's no structure. Uh, it's a complete guess. It's, it's, it's the dark matter. It's the unknown unknowns. So for these unknown unknowns, the truly novel compounds, you have to use a technique called computer-aided structure elucidation or CASE. Has anyone heard of that before? Or? Okay. For the known unknowns, what we're going to be doing is essentially chemical libraries and spectral libraries, and we're going to use spectral deconvolution. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. It's looking at the known unknowns, characterizing things that there, there's some information about them already, we just have to map them. So spectral deconvolution is the technique that we're going to use. It can be done for NMR, it can be done for GCMS, LCMS, and MSMS data. It's, to some extent, part of what we use in targeted metabolomics, although it's also what's done at the last step of, of untargeted metabolomics. It's matching peaks uh, from your spectra, your chromatogram, to a set of known peaks from pure compounds in a pre-compiled database. So that means someone has had to spend a lot of time and money buying all these compounds, collecting their NMR spectra, their GCMS spectra, their retention, times the retention indices, the LCMS spectra, the MSMS spectra, on a whole bunch of different instruments. For NMR, it might be at 400, 500, 600, 700, 800, 900, 1 gigahertz. For MS, it might be on a QTOF, a QTRAP, an ion trap, a FTICR, an Orbi trap. All of those have to be collected at different collision energies at 20, 10 and 20 and 40 electron volts. It's a huge amount of work. And there's only a very small number of groups actually who have been doing it. And to some extent now it's more become a collective enterprise. There are also companies that do it. And they sell these libraries at uh, fairly hefty prices. So we're going to look at NMR first. And as I said, or as we've learned, most of you haven't done NMR. Uh, but this is the concept, and it's, it's relatively simple. So remember, in, in metabolomics, we're dealing with mixture. So the top spectrum you're seeing here is the mixture one. That's in blue. And you can see, I don't know, a dozen different peaks. There's some big ones and some little ones. There's doublets and singlets and triplets. Um, and we know that there has to be a bunch of compounds in there. Um, now, in red and green and purple, um, what we have are the pure compound spectra. There's compound A, that's, I don't know, what's methionine, compound B, uh, leucine, and compound C, uh, adenosine, or something like that. Those are the different compounds, and we have their pure spectra. Now, if you kind of do the thought experiment, if you add these spectra together, the purple, the green, the red, you can see that they will sum up to produce the blue. You can see there's the red singlet on the far right, or your far right. And there's the purple triplet that's added. And then there's the two doublets from compound A and B, the green and the red, and they add up to produce a giant doublet. And then there's the red triplet. So these things all add up together. So we can see how taking the pure spectra of three different compounds add up to produce the mixture. What we have to do in deconvolution is the reverse problem. We have to take the mixture, the mixture and then decide which three out of maybe 100 or 300 uh, possible compounds would make up or con constitute this, this mixture. So there's the forward problem, the reverse problem. The forward one is easy, the reverse is, is harder. So there are tools where people have collected these single spectral um, uh, references and have compiled them and have created interactive software. So one is a, a software company called Konomics and it's quite <coughs> widely used and you can get 
um, your spectrum of uh, a mixture, uh, say from urine or blood or something like that, and it will allow you to interactively um, uh, fit individual pure reference spectra to your mixture. And it will produce a list of the compounds and their concentrations. Um, so the, the method itself um, is fairly manual intensive, but it's used by hundreds of people around the world. And it's been used for more than a decade. You will take your NMR spectrum, you'll transform it, you'll phase it, you'll uh, remove the water signal, you correct the baseline, you'll reference the chemical shifts, you'll normalize the peak shifts. So all of this has to be done manually. And then you fit the spectra. And it's done through guess and check. So you look at a peak and say, hmm, I think that looks like alanine. So you click on alanine and it pops up the alanine spectrum and you shift it around and say, oh, it was wrong. It must have been betaine. Um, and you pop up betaine and you shift around, oh, it looks like it's a nice fit, good. Um, so you have to have an idea of what sort of compounds are there. You have to have been trained a fair bit. And it takes about half an hour to an hour for a person to fit a spectrum. And if you've done it a fair bit, people are actually quite good at this. But it takes training. And years ago, this used to be part of our regular course. We would have people take the afternoon, and, and they would try and fit spectra. But we found it was taking too long. And we obviously found that a lot of people made lots of mistakes because they didn't have the training. So since then, we've tried to develop other methods to make it faster and easier. And other companies and groups have also done the same thing. So Brooker has a, a, a manual method to help with spectral deconvolution. Um, and then Brooker has developed uh, NMR uh, hardware with special software that will fit the spectra of juices. So you can collect NMR of juice, and you can collect NMR of wine or beer. And these will automatically identify the compounds, match the peaks, do all the spectral deconvolution. However, to get the juice screener and wine screener, you have to have half a million dollars in your back pocket, so most people don't have that. So are there some free alternatives? Yes, there are. Um, uh, Imperial College, which is one of the pioneers of metabolomics, Jeremy Nicholson's group, uh, and members of that have developed a program called Batman, uh, which does spectral deconvolution. And then we've developed one in Edmonton called Basil, and this also does uh, automatic deconvolution. So with NMR, it is now possible to automate it, and automation is now about 30 to 60 times faster. Um, and tests have been done on the precision and recall, and it's very, very consistent, better than 95%. <coughs> Basically, it means that you can upload lots and lots of spectra, uh, click go, and go home. And the next morning, all your results are there, or you can take a long coffee break, and your results are there. And when you have a computer doing it, it's consistent and entirely reproducible. But if, it's, if there's some bias, if you've collected the spectra incorrectly, or if you've added things. Yes? Does it learn the system itself? The more you add, like the more you confirm, or it's fixed? It's fixed. Um, it, there was a learning period when it was originally developed. Um, but yes, now it's fixed. Um, so, um, so the advantages of using computers is that they can, they can work forever and never get tired. Um, but if there's some bias, they can't pick that up, and so they'll reproducibly generate the wrong result, um, which can be problems. Um, but it's also a case where, because it doesn't get tired, and because it's able to look for signals that are often ignored by humans, either deliberately or just subtly, it's able to do things that sometimes even humans can't do. Um, so... Uh, Batman is, is uh, now a project, and it's, uh, I think there's one that's on GitHub or um, SourceForge, I think. So you can actually download the program and, and uh, give it a whirl. It's, it's very slow, uh, so it's not 30 to 60 times faster than humans. Um, but it doesn't get tired, which is an advantage. Um, Bazel is fast, um, and it's been converted to web server. And it does use machine learning, or it used machine learning to get accurate. Um, 
And it uses things that are called hidden Markov models uh, or probabilistic graphical models to help with the deconvolution. Um, it does essentially what the Konomic software does except automatically. So it does sort of guess and check, um, performing a fitting and pattern finding. Um, in order for it to work, you have to, or it needs to know what the biofluid is. So if you don't tell it that this is, you know, blood or cerebral spinal fluid, um, it gets completely lost. And it's sort of like, you know, taking a person and blindfolding them and say, go find your way, way home. So it needs some knowledge. Question. <coughs> so is this then only able to handle, like, samples from humans? Uh, no. Um, there's enough similarity uh, between the serum or plasma of sheep and cows and mice and rats. Um, so no, it won't do that. So it, it has to have, uh, so right now it's specific to um, a certain set of biofluids. So it's uh, cerebral spinal fluid um, to plasma, and I think, I don't know, was it saliva? I can't remember. Um, and uh, some work's being done to expand it expand the libraries to, to other types of, of, of situations. And it somewhat depends on how complex the fluid is. So it doesn't work for urine. It fails completely um, because it's just too complex. And the HMMs just die. Um, now, in terms of um, the other thing that does, and that was really critical, was that because manipulating NMR spectra is something of an art, if we have 30 people in this room and we said, okay, all of you try and phase, reference, remove water, and baseline correct, there's going to be 30 different spectra. And they're all going to look subtly different. Some will look very, very similar, but some will look really different. And then if you try fitting those spectra, everyone's going to get a different answer. So by automating all of these steps, 30 people are going to get 30 identical spectra, so that means the fit will also be identical for everyone. So this is how complicated it can get. You can see this is a, the top examples are a spectrum of 90 compounds, the bottom one is 150 different compounds, there are peaks on top of peaks on top of peaks, um, and you can see how things are deconvoluted. So well-trained humans can do this by hand, uh, but most of you wouldn't want to get that training, and so this is the advantage of actually having a computer doing that sort of spectral deconvolution. Here's an example of cerebral spinal fluid that was done by uh, a manual method. The red is the fitted spectrum uh, done using Konomics, and there's the black spectrum of, it's actually the, the, the actual spectrum. And then below that is a um, uh, one that's being fit uh, with basal and the red basically matches with the black, and the difference is one took 45 minutes, the other one took um, between three and five minutes. Now today we're going to give Basil a try, um, and right now our, our TA and uh, uh, Jeff are madly working at <laughs> communicating to Edmonton um, to make sure this one will work. Um, so there's two versions. There's a public version of, of Basil. Uh, which allows, has a different website, um, so it's just basil.ca. Um, and then there's the private version, uh, which is called tmic.basil.ca. And the tmic.basil.ca will require a login, which we'll, we'll show you guys later. Um, but, so you guys don't go to it, I'm going to ask everyone to make sure they close their lids on their computers, because uh, I think you need to concentrate on this stuff now. Um, so we'll fill you in on this, uh, but it's, the whole idea is to make it trivially simple. There's going to be some data that you're going to be able to just, once you've logged in, you can download it. Um, you can also use the public version and use some of the examples, and all it is just point, click, wait, and then start viewing the, the results. So that's metabolomics made easy. Um, you don't have to learn any special skills. You just have to be able to use your mouse. Um, and what this is, is a form of targeted metabolomics uh, that's fully automatic. And this is ideally what you'd like to be able to do with everything in metabolomics. 
where the software is written so it has the libraries where you can get essentially complete coverage where you can get every compound identified everything quantified <coughs> uh, everything annotated uh, and unfortunately we still have a long ways to go uh, with other other fields or other aspects of metabolomics but this is this is an example of where it needs to go so if you've uploaded things if you've um, started it, what you'll have is first thing it'll get the spectrum, it'll show the spectrum for you. This is what uh, an initial spectrum might look like. Uh, this is highly unphased. Um, so after it's done the Fourier transform, it'll then do the phasing so that all the peaks are pointing up in the right direction. And then it'll start doing uh, the water removal, the baseline correction, the chemical shift referencing, uh, the peak convolution. And so after about 30 seconds, it goes from what was at the top, which is unusable, to what's at the bottom, which is usable. And it'll do this exactly the same every single time. So it's done all of this automatically. Then for the next two to three minutes, it's going to take that and do the spectral deconvolution. So this is the spectral deconvolution. You can see a faint blue against the black. The blue is the fitted spectra, the black is the actual spectrum. And so everything now is matched. So cool, you've got a spectral fit, but really the more useful point here is this. This is your annotated spectrum. Every compound in the spectrum has been identified and the absolute concentration has been generated. So that's automatic metabolomics. And as I said, this is where you want to go. This is where we should be going in the field. And the nice thing about NMR is because the, it's not a particularly sensitive technique, you can do this. Um, what's that? I can't. Oh, there's a confidence score. So the confidence score is an indication of, of essentially based on how many peaks are being fit and how complex the spectrum is. So uh, acetate is, or acetic acid um, is usually characterized by a single peak, uh, but if it's well isolated, um, then uh, the confidence score goes up. If there are other peaks nearby uh, that are partly overlapping it, then the confidence score will go down. Um, if there's other compounds with lots of peaks, um, like glucose, which has 20 or 30 peaks, um, then uh, that also increases the confidence score. So zero to 10. That's right. So earlier we had the question, you know, does it do uh, bacterial culture? And so no. Uh, it's configured right now to do serum, plasma, cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, there's some modifications that are being done uh, to do things like fecal water um, and saliva. As I said before, it doesn't work for urine. How many compounds in the database? Uh, right now it has about 100, uh, a little over 110, I think. Well, presumably you're dealing with non bugs. What happens with the non bugs? So, in those cases, it won't identify, and that's essentially why it's restricted to these things. So, we know everything at least from NMR that's in serum and plasma and CSF. Everything has been characterized that NMR can detect. So in that case, it's a, it's a solved problem. Um, and that's, again, because uh, with NMR, we can only detect things at 5 micromolar. Um, and even for you know, some of the inborn errors of metabolism, which you'll get some bizarre compounds, rare compounds, those, again, are known and they're detectable. Um, occasionally, if someone has overdosed on some bizarre drug, you won't have any idea, but um, that's really not what this was intended for. Um, what we're trying to do, and I think this is important, people don't miss the point, quantitative or targeted metabolomics is not about identifying new compounds. It's about identifying the changes in concentration. And there's a tremendous amount of information about understanding those differences in concentrations. Uh, metabolically, everyone in this room is pretty much the same. 
everyone's going to have alanine in their blood, everyone's going to have methionine, everyone's going to have ATP. I mean, otherwise you're an alien. Um, so, um, but what distinguishes us is just how there's going to be different concentrations of those. Some are going to be having higher levels, and some are going to be having lower levels, and some of that reflects your health, some of that reflects your age, your gender, a bunch of other things. Um, and so if you just think, or you can do the computation, if there's something is high, normal, or below normal, that's three states, just from concentrations. So if you have 100 different compounds that you're measuring, you can measure 3 to the 100 different states. That's a big number. And that's essentially, I think, the, the, the central power of dealing with quantitative metabolomics. That you can distinguish and come up with billions, trillions of different patterns and therefore potentially identify or distinguish billions or trillions of different states or conditions. So, in case of a human metabolized database, uh, you can find the concentration, biological concentration of uh, any metabolites. But over there, you can see they put number of range, and they are not in the same range, they are just scattered all around them. How we can understand what is the normal range? Yeah, part of it is, a, I think, a, a challenge with people, different groups at different times having collected with different technologies. More and more there are standard ranges, and um, at least with the human metabolism database, we've tried to get um, a, a reference ranges for about um, about 300 to 500 commonly measured metabolites. Uh, and some of this has been gathered through text, to, uh, also from our own studies in, in TMIC. We won't have uniformly agreeing ranges for every metabolite from every study. It's just some of it's because people have made mistakes, some of it's because the different populations uh, which weren't clearly distinguished. There are distinctions for age and gender, um, and we've tried to identify those, so you'll see that in, in HMDB. There are also cases for different diseases, and those ranges are also given. Uh, it's, it's a lot of hard work, um, and I say it's something that we're constantly refining. Okay, so there are limits. Um, it's what you're going to hopefully use today is, is multiple spectra. Uh, that's what the TMIC basal one does. The public one only does a single spectrum at a time. So upload a spectrum, wait a few minutes, and upload another one, wait a few minutes, and so on. And lots of people do that. Um, but the one for batch one is, is uh, hopefully the one we'll, we'll try today, and, and hopefully you can get a, a flavor for that. Okay, so that's NMR. Um, question. Can you just clarify, <coughs> it's, it's a collection of the sample. How, you say it's precise, what, it, what do you mean by precise? The way that you collect the sample? Um, for, for NMR? Well, yeah, for the, because it mentioned on the previous slide that you have to go back. Can we go back? No, no, forward. So be careful to prepare and collect samples. Yeah. So when you prepare an NMR sample, you have to add um, a reference. So DSS is the reference compound that you have to add. You have to buffer it, so it's pH 7, because sometimes people put things that are very acidic or very basic. And so again, this is buffered and set for a standard pH. And then you also have to add uh, a phasing compound, uh, which has a chemical shift up around 10 or 11 parts per million. Uh, what we found is that, you know, this is the recipe that people were required to do, and no one read the recipe. Um, so people were throwing all kinds of stuff in. Uh, they didn't pH, they didn't put, they put the wrong reference compound, uh, they were collecting at 700 megahertz, even though we said collect at 600, and, and then they said it didn't work. Well, it's not going to. Um, so it's that's right. Yeah, it's not the not how you're collecting your blood or how you're collecting the CSF. No. 
So yeah, it, it's it's more the sample post sample prep if you want to call it that. Okay. Yes. I had a quick question about uh, like data compatibility. Do all of the NMR machines output data in a similar format, or are they all different? Uh, essentially, they output it all in the same way. Yes, um, but just there are different frequencies that NMR machines work, and so there's in those cases there's higher and higher and very high resolution. So, um, so the spectra will look different, and so it has to know which frequency well, you're working. In terms of just like format, any NMR format that comes off the machine is compatible. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so the reason why we're making, you know, a, a deal out of NMR. Do you have a question? Um, why is it only limited to the Python instance of the um, That's the public version. Um, the, if you want to call it a private one, the TMIC one, it's 500, 600, 700, I think 800 is on the way, um, and it does a little bit more. The, um, it, it takes a long time to build out the reference libraries. Um, I mean, you have to have a lab that has a 500 and a 600 and a 700 and an 800, and that's you know like six million dollars worth of equipment. Um, so it's that's expensive to, to build out. Um, the um, other uh, point I was going to make is that the reason why we're talking about NMR, even though most of you don't do it, is because we wanted to use it as an exemplar because this is, I would hope, maybe three years, maybe five years from now. <laughs> This is how you could do LCMS. You know, go to web server, just upload your spectra, um, and, and walk away, and, and out comes this annotated list. Uh, and it's not just 200; it's it's you know several thousand. Uh, you guys are going to have an exam. Or, you know, we're going to look at untargeted metabolomics, and some of you were here last night as we were installing XCMS and other things. It's it is not uh, point and click. It's it's a lot of um, Scripting, coding, waiting, reconvoluting, going back again, checking. So it's very, very manually intensive. But uh, I think as, as a field matures, things become increasingly automated. And in case NMR based metabolomics is mature, it is um, the most mature form of, of metabolomics right now. Okay, so GCMS. This is the next most mature version. And in GCMS, we have a, an ion chromatogram. Uh, TIC uh, will have peaks. Any individual peak might have two, three, four other compounds, or it could be a pure compound. Within those peaks, you're going to have very characteristic spectra, electron impact or electron ionization spectra. And whether it's the blue or the red or the green, you're going to compare those uh, EIMS spectra to what's in a library, a spectral library. And the spectral library may have 100, 1,000, 10,000. And what you're going to try and do is match those spectral uh, that you collected with the spectral library. <coughs> so in the case of GCMS, you use electron impact ionization. An example with methanol, here's the characteristic fingerprint. This is a methanol reference spectrum. Um, and because these are highly reproducible, there's a standard... Um, Electron ionization energy is 70 electron volts. Everything in GCMS is, is very standard. It means it's possible to compare, not unlike with NMR, which is also very standardized. Um, with the GCMS spectra, you'll see these fragments. Occasionally, you'll see the molecular ion, and occasionally, you'll also sometimes see adducts. But in most cases, it's just the, the fragments and, and not the molecular ion. Um, many cases, we're working with uh, analytes that need to be derivatized. So you have TMS, tetramethylsilane, TBDMS. In some cases you'll have methoxine uh, derivatization. These will modify uh, alcohols or aldehydes or amines. And, and that result is that you are not looking at the original compound in GCMS, you're looking at a derivatized one. And the derivatized compound could have one TMS, two TMSs, three TMSs, four TMSs. So one compound could have six signals with six different retention indices, six different mass spectra, six different masses. TBDMS, the same thing. 
What's nice, though, is that you can look at sort of these mass increments because it's it's a known derivative. So you're just going to look to see if it's 72 Daltons or 144 Daltons higher than what you would expect for the pure compound, the underivitized compound. So GCMS is good for working with amino acids, really good for organic acids, pretty good for sugars, really good for uh, short chain fatty acids, um, and basically molecules with a molecular weight of less than maybe 500 or 600 Daltons. I mentioned before that GC is very high resolution, very high plate counts. Its EIMS is very standardized, uh, so the EI spectra are very comparable from any reference source around the world. Most people use a combination of a program called AMDIS, um, which we'll talk about later, and then the National Institute for Standards, or NIST database. So I think and NIST 17, I think, is coming out. Or, but the NIST 14 MS database is pretty widely used. And this is huge. So this is hundreds of thousands of EI spectra mm -hmm. for about 240,000 compounds. Now that's a bit of an exaggeration because many compounds have TMS and TMDBS derivatives. So they're basically, it's the same compound, but it's just been derivatized many, many different times. So the number of truly unique compounds is about 20, 25,000, I think. Uh, they also have ion trap MS, and they also have QTOF and triple quad MS data, which is also pretty cool, except they only collect the more produced sort of single, at least with the MS, MS spectra, they produce um, consensus um, spectra rather than individual um, <coughs> energies. They have lots of retention indices uh, for about 80,000 compounds. So it's, it's a vast resource. Um, there's some things that aren't great about it, but um, it's still uh, pretty amazing and it's quite affordable. Uh, there's software that allows you to search through the NIST database and to do some matches. And then there's another piece of software uh, that you get with uh, NIST, which is called the Automated Mass Spectral Deconvolution and Identification System, or AMDIS. And this has been around for years, like decades. Um, and it, it basically does peak identification. Um, it looks for background noise. It identifies peaks relative to the noise. It then does a, generates a model spectrum, and then it does this spectral deconvolution. Um, and it uses the NIST library. So it's, as I say, this has been around for, I don't know, 30 years or more. Uh, conceptually, it's not unlike the basal, except, you know, the spectra are a little simpler in some respects because you've got this separation, whereas in NMR you don't separate. There's no liquid chromatography. You just dump the whole thing in the tube and collect. With GC, you've already done separation, so you've got, you know, somewhat simpler spectra to work with. To match your spectra, uh, Basil uses sim something similar to a match factor to assess it, but um, you know for GCMS they, they call it match factor, and it's measuring the query to the database, and it's basically saying if I've got five peaks here and five peaks here, I'm going to slide it over and see how well they match. And this is essentially the matching is done through a, a, a dot product. If you've ever heard of linear algebra and you do uh, dotting two vectors together and normalizing by their intensities. And they multiply the match factor by a thousand and they scale things. So basically if the match factor is about 600, 650 and above, up to a maximum of a thousand, uh, that's a good hit. And so you can see these match factor scores and, and that's sort of what you look for. Say, yeah, I've got something. Now, you're never going to get a perfect match, you're never going to get a thousand, even for perfect compounds, even if you put in the pure compound, because there's just variations on the instrument. Um, but you could get 990 uh, or something like that. Um, and that's, again, a very good indication that, that these are identical compounds. If you're doing GCMS, um, you do have to do some calibration and normalization. Just like with NMR. NMR we had to add uh, DSS, NMR we had to do phasing. In GCMS, before you start off, you have to have a set of alkane standards. About eight or nine of them, starting from octane to uh, C16 or C18, hexadecane. 
and these are a calibration standard. Also, when you do GCMS, you need to have a blank sample. So that's basically putting in your solvent and usually the derivatization agents, the TMS or the TDBMS or the methoxine, whatever you've added, because this is sort of contaminant stuff that's going to show up when you have your authentic sample. So you have your calibration standard, your blank sample, and then your sample or samples of interest. This is your blood, your urine, whatever you're wanting to do. And they have to be run under the same elution conditions, same temperature gradient as, as what you ran your blank. So this is what you collect with your, your external standards. There's, I don't know, eight, nine, ten peaks there. This alkane mixture allows you to calculate your retention indices. So remember you had retention time, now you convert it to retention index. That normalizes everything. Uh, so that's your calibration file, CAL. Um, and that will recalculate recal the retention times with the alkanes. And then you're going to search your NIST database for those matches, both with retention indices. Um, and when you have this blank spectrum, there's also going to be a way of getting rid of any of these extra peaks, the TMS peaks, the methoxine peaks. Yes? Uh, was it normalized to like, change the temperature in the oven at the time? Or you have a column heater or something like that? You know, was it, can you, because your retention index is going to change. Yeah, so you want to use the same protocol both when you run the alkanes as when you run the blanks, when you run the actual sample. And so if you have a a, a programmed heating ramp that you know goes up and levels and it goes up like that. That heating program has to be identical for all three, including your alkane standards. And then with that, then yes, it'll it'll calibrate or normalize properly. So with the AMDIS software, here we are creating the calibration file. So AMDIS allows you to do that. Uh, here's your loaded spectrum, then you normalize using, again, a pull-down menu. We're not going to run AMDIS today, but this is sort of just for your information. So after AMDIS uh, has done that calibration, then you can start doing your, your database searches. Um, so you'll move your window over a certain peak. Here we've moved over one that's about, I don't know, 11 or 12 minutes. Um, and under that peak, there's, uh, that's the chromatogram peak, we're going to see some masses. Uh, there's one at, again, it's hard for me to see here. Um, look here. Um, 73 and 172 and I don't know, maybe it's 140. Um, those are marked with red, yellow, and blue. And these correspond to the masses of, from the EIMS spectrum. So you're going to have your GC peak list, and you're going to have your EIMS spectrum for each of these peaks. Uh, you can zoom in a little more, and then you can actually try and see how well this particular peak, we've zoomed in a little bit more, how this peak matches to the uh, NIST spectrum or the NIST database. And in this case, we have a match factor of 840 or 84% as they've calibrated. And we've, we've now got a match of 73 and 144. Uh, the red and the blue are the two best matches. And they match to the reference spectrum, which is shown below this one. And you can see it's almost identical. Um, so in this case, this peak, single compound, is valine. Um, so um, we could have also checked with the retention index, and we would have also found the retention index for valine would have also been very, very close. So we would have had two or three pieces of information. The mass spec uh, with the 73 and the 144, retention index, um, all saying this is valine. So in this regard, we've been able to identify, and then if we measure the area under the curve, we could partially quantify um, how much is there. So. AMDIS and GCR and, and, and the NIST database allows you to manually go through GCMS spectra and identify compounds. So if you started, you know, this morning uh, with one spectrum, sometime this afternoon you would finish annotating that one. And if you had a thousand spectra, that's about a thousand days of work. So there are alternatives. Um, we're going to introduce you to GSO AutoFit, 
so that's something you could just automate it. Uh, there are other tools outside of AMDIS, Analyzer Pro, uh, Chromatof. Uh, these were compared about 10 years ago. Uh, there are different databases. The NIST 14 is the latest one. There's NIST 11, NIST 8. They come out every three years, so NIST 17 should be coming up. Um, there's the GOLM database, and then Oliver Fiend's group has created a database it's now sold by Lico and Agilent. Uh, the GOLM database is an open access database. Um, different purposes, GOLM is focused primarily on plants. The Fiend database is, is more varied. It uses a different calibration standard than what most people use. So as I said, just like with Basil, we wanted to be able to teach people how to do GC. Uh, and so we developed this tool um, to sort of automate it. Uh, so it's called GC AutoFit. Um, it needs three spectra. It needs your blank. It needs your alkane standards. And then it needs your sample spectrum. Uh, it does auto spectral alignment. It does peak identification, peak picking, peak integration. Uh, it takes most of the normal types of fa files. It's pretty fast. And it can measure up to about 100 different compounds, depending on the sample. It's best uh, with analyzing urine. Uh, so unlike NMR, which chokes on urine, this one does really well with urine. Uh, it does OK with blood and saliva and CSF. But if you don't follow the protocol with the derivatization and other things, then it won't work. And this is something that I think we really have to emphasize, is that when you standardize the protocols, um, things really work. If you don't follow the protocol, it doesn't, doesn't work. And it's like following a recipe. If you, you know, leave out the egg and the sugar, the cake won't look or taste very good. So this is the website. Um, and um, these are the types of files that you can upload. Um, and we'll go through this in, in the lab anyways, so it's probably just easier to, to read it. Uh, there's different freeware tools to do conversion if you happen to have something that's not compatible with, with what GC AutoFit has. It's pretty simple, point and click. Um, you can have zip files or you can upload individual files. Uh, so you upload your spectra. Again, just like with basal, it needs to know whether it's looking at blood or urine uh, or whatever biofluid because it has a, its own spectral library. Um, you can also upload your own internal library if you have prepared it in the standard way. Um, you also need an internal standard to help with the quantification. And so that internal standard, whether it's cholesterol or succinate, has to be added to the sample. Um, and you can choose which biofluid. I think you guys are going to be doing urine this time. Is that correct, Jeff and Namo? Yeah, it's urine. Uh, so select the fluid, uh, select the library. Uh, it'll kick out a couple of uh, sample spectra just to make sure that you haven't uploaded something that's empty. Um, so you can see that there's a file there, and you can see that things, the alkane standard looks decent. And then it'll run through and annotate your spectra. So it's not going to do the fitting that Basil does. It'll write over top of each of the peaks what the compound is. And similar to Basil, it'll indicate um, the name of the compound. It'll give you a concentration. Um, I think it gives you a, a match factor score. You can see there's 780, 760. Uh, it'll identify the ions that were picked out as being the, the key ones to, to help with the identification. So it looks very similar in terms of output as basal. Uh, in this case, it's your annotated list. Now that's the web view. Uh, you can also download the results in a CSV file, a text file, um, and then you can also just view the spectra. So that's GCMS. Uh, or GC AutoFit. So that's another example of automation. And it's, it's a little closer to LCMS. Um, but in this case, it's, it's defined. So it doesn't work for bacterial extracts, because the library hasn't been built for that. Um, and again, it is critical on following the protocol. 
And the protocols, both for Bazel and for GC Autofit, were designed to be sort of consensus protocols, ones that just about everyone uses. So it's not, you know, very specific for very rare um, reagents or really strange um, processes. Now, sorry, quick uh, question. Yes. Can you talk a bit more about the thresholds for uh, annotation accuracy? On one of the previous slides, it had about sixty percent. Would that be similar for uh, this, this software? Yeah, whether it's in terms of a match factor, uh, about 600 or 60 percent is sort of a minimum that people will, will say is, is worth it. And that's, it's a fuzzy cutoff. It's not a hard one. Um, you know, if you're, if you've got a great retention index match and only a 600 um, with a spectral match, then that's probably more confident. If we've got a lousy retention index and even at 700, um, then it's probably not the compound. So there's pieces of evidence which are sort of highlighted here in this slide, which is uh, the Metabolomic Standard Initiative, or MSI, for um, metabolite identification. Um, there's, I guess, it's level one, level two, level three, level four. Um, level one uh, is things that you've actually positively identified. In fact, you have the authentic compound, and you put it in and you get exactly the same spectrum, exactly the same retention time or index or same NMR spectrum, and you say, this is it. Most people, unfortunately, don't have chemical libraries, and most people never do this, uh, which is a real problem, because this is, in fact, technically the only way you can report compound identities. Uh, the second most one, level two, is what is formally called a putatively identified compound. So that's when you get the mass spectrum, EIMS, MSMS, and the retention time or the retention index. You know, you're getting a match factor of 800, you're getting a retention index match or retention time match, or you've done a basal fit and all the spectra looks perfect, it's a perfect match uh, with many, many spectra. That's considered a level two, although in NMR, I think many people are saying that would actually be a level one. Then there's level three, which is essentially saying I've got a a lipid and it's a PC326. It's a class, it's phosphatidylcholine. 326 is also a class because it's saying there's a, uh, you know, a, either a 14 and 18 or a 16 and a 16 chain and you don't know whether it's an SN1 or SN2 or SN3. So that's only saying I've got an approximate identity. Uh, and then the vast majority are the unknown unknowns, unknown compounds. You say I've got a peak, I've got a retention index, and I've got a mass, I've got a chemical shift, a bunch of chemical shifts, but I don't know what it is. That's still an annotation, uh, and it still falls up to level four, but obviously you haven't identified anything. Um, so this was originally designed for MS. As I say, it's not really compatible with NMR, because if you have a perfect match with intensities and chemical shifts by NMR, that is positively identified. Um, and that's as it's long been used as the gold standard for chemical characterization. Um, so LCMS, uh, the method for identification, is basically very, very similar, uh, or identical if you want. Um, you have your chromatogram, um, you have your spec. If you have MSMS -MS spectra, then you're matching to MSMS. -MS. Many people, unfortunately, only match to the parent ion mass and say, I've got something at, at 276.167, and this is my compound. That's wrong uh, and, and basically should be avoided. Um, unfortunately, 90% of people doing metabolomics do it this way, and uh, we want to try and get you away from doing that. You want to be able to do spectral matching with MSMS, -MS, if possible or MSMS in retention time. Identifying compound purely by its molecular weight or purely by its chemical formula is extremely risky and, and technically falls more into the level three uh, standard of identification. So there are a variety of tools uh, for doing uh, MSMS. Um, with commercial tools, uh, all the major manufacturers from Agilent, Brooker, Thermo, Waters, etc., SciX. Then there's a bunch of free options, uh, XCMS, XCMS Online, MZMine, uh, several others. 
Uh, we're going to be looking at XCMS. And Nama has also told you guys to set up an XCMS online account as well. Um, we'll explain XMS a little bit more uh, also during the, um, the lab that will follow after lunch. So the reason why we're doing XMS is because it was basically the first open source, open access tool for, for MS spectral processing and metabolomics. It does peak picking, it does peak matching, it does retention time alignment, which are all <coughs> critical. You can get it as a server, that's XMS online, or as a standalone, which I think is installed on most of your programs. It accepts many different formats. And uh, it is linked to a database called Metlin, which is widely used. Um, so with liquid chromatography mass spectrometry, what you typically do is you collect many, this is primarily untargeted mass spectrometry, so uh, it's different than basal, it's different than GC autofit. This is where you're collecting lots of spectra for lots of samples. And with LCMS, there's always tremendous amount of drifting, how the, the LC performs. Uh, so something that had a retention time of 28 minutes at the beginning of the day will have a retention time of 32 minutes at the end of the day. Uh, and between that, it may have gone higher or lower. So it, it's moving all over. So what you have to do is uh, not only with retention time, you have to then identify the peaks, aligning things. So this is where the extracted ion chromatograms uh, are selected. There's some nonlinear alignment methods. So once you've picked those out and aligned them, then you can do some more formal peak picking. Then the MS uh, data will give you uh, an accurate, uh, if you've got a high resolution instrument, uh, an accurate mass. And then you can extract from there the MS, MS, if you have done it, if you haven't then XMS will still allow you to identify compounds by the mass match uh, alone, but it's not, not recommended. Peak detection is hard with mass spectrometry, LCMS. Um, the peak detection algorithms are always evolving. Uh, XMS uses a relatively old one, which at the time was very good, but uh, there are better ones now that have come out. Um, it will um, fit things according to a sort of a, a function um, to, to maximize um, the peak intensity and reduce sort of the uh, nearby neighbors to give you a, a, a central peak that you'll work with. Um, it does a nice job of, of peak alignment and retention time alignment. Um, the top spectrum is an example of just the natural drift that you get. You don't get this drift with NMR, you don't get this drift with GC. So it is an issue for LC, but when you do this, uh, you can see how everything matches up quite nicely. And when they started comparing XCMS, um, about, I guess this is 10 years ago, uh, it had the highest uh, precision and recall in terms of identifying peaks and picking peaks out. Subsequently, it's not the best. There are other programs that are doing better, but it's still pretty good. Yes? So I think this peak detection that you're talking about here is the mesh filter method mm -hmm. in XCMS. Mm -hmm. And they have since, or like a few years later, made the scent wave yes. method. Is that still, or like, would you consider that like state of the art, or do you use something else? Um, the it's probably pretty close to state of the art, but there's there's other issues in terms of peak detection um, and the peak alignment that are still uh, an issue, um, and whether it's the scent wave filtering or, or other types of filters, it's not just that alone. There's a lot of other things that, that need to be done to, to actually get good peaks uh, and to be certain of those peaks. So there's still a continuing problem with XCMS of false positives. Um, too many. And so there's other programs that have reduced that and the specific details that they have, I, I don't know. Um, the, um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty robust program. So it's, it's, we're not saying don't use it. It's just you are going to get um, slightly more false positives than some of the other ones. Uh, and for high resolution, um, spec data, 
correct to rather use the synth wave than the mesh filter? Well, that's probably now the default. So uh, you probably wouldn't be using a match filter now um, anymore, or you'd have to go deep into the program to ask if you wanted to use a match filter. So um, this is just a, taking you through what you would do with XCMS online. Uh, you're going to learn how to use XCMS offline. Um, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but it is a, a useful server. Um, it's not something you want to have 30 people doing at the same time. In fact, we would be blacklisted very quickly, and they'd shut us down. And, um, and it, it's also a case that it, XMS on, online is not really fast. Uh, you have to be able to expect to spend or wait sometimes a couple of hours or try and sign on at midnight or at low user time so you can access it. You also have to have an account, um, so it's not open access. Um, but once you've got an account, which I think many of you now have, uh, you can create a job. Um, and there are different types of jobs, where there's looking at multi-group analysis, pairwise analysis, uh, multiple studies. So you can pick and choose which job, and if you've chosen, in this case, a pairwise job, looking at two groups, which is generally the most common metabolomics type of experiment, then you can upload your two data sets, one for cases, one for controls, and again, it's relatively user-friendly. Once you've defined your uh, panels, then you can start uploading your spectra, and again, different options, and I'm not going to go into those details because it's probably even slightly different. Uh, so you've uploaded your spectra. Uh, because you're uploading hundreds of megabytes usually, uh, that takes a while, especially if you've got a slow connection. Um, what's wonderful about XCMS is it has an enormous capacity for handling all kinds of different instrument types. Um, a long, long list. Uh, so we had one which was just an HPL single quad. Almost no one does that anymore. I think the data itself is like 15 years old. But it was compatible. Um, so you're able to do that. Once you've told it what sort of format it is, then you just click Submit. Uh, wait a while. A long time. <laughs> Too long for this course, actually. But then eventually you, you'll see it'll tell you where your queue is. And then you can wait for an email <coughs> notification. And then once you've got your notification, um, you can download the results, including your peak list tables. And this will give you your mass peak identifiers, retention times, intensities. So note that this is not quantitative. These are relative intensities. So yes, if the intensity is 1,000 for one and the intensity is 100 for the other, probably uh, the one with 1,000 is more abundant. But remember, with mass spectrometry, that's essentially a measure of, of how an ion flies. It's not necessarily a pure measure of its abundance. On the other hand, with NMR, peak intensity matches exactly with concentration. And if you've done with the GC autofit all of the appropriate calibrations for quantitation and quantitation standards, then yes, you can also do that. So with untargeted metabolomics, you're simply doing relative quantification, relative measures. So as I said, there's XMS has an issue with false positives. Intensities are only relative. Um, unless you link to Metlin, you aren't going to get the peaks identified to compound names. Um, and that's where you, you need the Metlin database. So that's a, a quick run through of, of XCMS online. We're not going to do it today, although you're free to do it in the, af in the evening, you're free to do it at home. Um, it is, I, I think, a widely used program by many people. Um, so with NMR, we talked about how it was better for certain things, GCMS better for certain things. LCMS, really good for lipids. <coughs> this is where almost all lipidomics is done. Uh, you can do fatty acids and bases and amino acids. It's best for more hydrophobic molecules. Even if you use HILIC, it's still a better technique for hydrophobic ones. Really, if you want to do high-quality identification, you need MS, MS data, tandem MS data. You need retention time. You need internal standards. If 
for some reason you can't do MSMS -MS, or you're just desperate to get information or if it's a case where it's more of a defined standard set and mixture that you're looking at and you just need to be able to say which one is which. Uh, maybe you don't need to have the MS spectral matching. So you can do mass matching. So mass matching, as I say, strongly discouraged, but it is possible, and if it's a case that you, you don't have any other resource, you can go and search against Kebby, against PubChem, against ChemSpider, or against uh, the Human Metabolome Database. So the largest database in the world for chemistry is PubChem. And I don't know how many of you have used PubChem. How many people have played around with it? Not that many? Okay. Anyways. Uh, you can do a mass search. You can choose to search for uh, a mass range. In this case, we've chosen from 89 to 89.1 Daltons. And here's the list of 400-odd uh, compounds that, that have that match. Um, so that's a mass, mass range search. You can do the same thing with KEBI, uh, Chemical Entities of Biological Interest. And you can do that for HMDB. Now, that's not something you normally do. Um, uh, generally, you want to be able to do uh, more advanced MS searching. You want to be able to look at, at actual spectra and upload those spectra and see if those spectra match to anything. Now, I'm going to emphasize something just about these, these different databases whether it's Kebby or PubChem, ChemSpider, HMDB. And I'll, I'll re-emphasize this again later, but PubChem is the largest database. Um, probably HMDB is the smallest database. Um, the PubChem has, I think, 85 million, ChemSpider around 50 million, Kebby has about 60,000, HMDB has about 42,000 compounds. Um, 99.5% of the compounds in PubChem are irrelevant to metabolomics. 99.5% uh, of the compounds have never left the lab. So they are not in humans, they're not in animals, they're not in plants, they're not in microbes, they're not in the environment. So if you're going to be doing a search against PubChem or ChemSpider, you have a 99.5% chance of getting a false positive. Unfortunately, a lot of people in the metabolomics community do that, and they publish basically junk, uh, claiming that based on mass matches, they found something which cannot physically be in the environment, or in an animal, or in a human. Um, same sort of thing as they say, okay, I'm not going to use PubChem, I'm going to be smart, I'm going to use Kebby. So Kebby is a collection of metabolites that is, or compounds that are biologically interesting. So it has, you know, really interesting mushroom metabolites. It has really interesting fruit fly metabolites. <coughs> it has really interesting phytochemical or, or sponge metabolites. Those are things you're not going to find in humans or in mice. You have to know from where these things come from. So again, you could get a nice match to a mass or even to a chemical formula in Kebby, but if you don't worry about the origin or provenance of the, of the chemical, you'll also get garbage. So from the perspective of metabolomics, really the best thing is to go to databases that are specific to an organism. So if you're studying humans or other mammals, including mice, probably the human metabolite database is a good one. Uh, that would cover basically what you will expect to find in mammals. If you're wanting to look at bacteria, go to a bacteria database. If you're looking at yeast, go to a yeast database. If you're looking at plants, go to a plant database. This is also a problem with Metlin because it's also amalgamated all kinds of different uh, databases from many different organisms. It's a similar problem with lipid maps where they've also merged lipids from insects, plants, and humans, uh, which again, you're not going to find insect lipids in humans and plant lipids in insects and so on. So we'll go into the mass advanced searches. Um, so you can do molecular weight searches, but you can also do parent ion searches. You can look for positive negative ions. You can put in peak lists. 
Um, so these are really intended for um, high-end mass spectral searching. So most people are familiar with METLIN. We'll talk about that later. We'll also talk about mass bank. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about CFMID, which I don't think most of you have heard of. Um, so this is a, a tool um, that was developed a couple years ago um, to actually predict mass spectra. So you can take a compound, any compound, and it will predict the EIMS or ESIMS spectra, tandem mass spectra. And it does a pretty good job. It'll predict the intensities, it'll predict locations, it also identifies the fragment ions and annotates them. Um, it also allows you to do compound identification from uploaded MSMS MS spectra. So you can type in all of your peaks and peak intensities and it will look through its own library of um, mass spectra. And some of them, the newer version will have actually real spectra, but also has a lot of the predicted spectra from HMDB, so for 42,000. And also has it from KEG, which covers all the other organisms, um, plants, and microbes. So the total number of compounds, something around 60,000 or so, uh, that it would have, that it will do a match for. So if you wanted to do that sort of search, you can click between these. So you want to, here's my spectrum, what is the compound? You can upload it. Um, here's your list of peaks. Depending on the collision energy you've chosen, in case of an MSMS spectrum, 20, 10, 20, or 40 electron volts. And then it'll run through and generate a match, and it'll rank things. And the blue ones are the observed, the red are the database, and then it'll indicate sort of the match factor score and, and the ranking. So with the issue of, of just doing uh, tandem, or not even tandem, but just high-resolution mass spectra, you're going to have lots of peaks. And, and these peaks um, come from adducts, come from neutral losses, and they come from multiple charging events. And these peaks essentially represent noise. They're confounders to MS analysis. And so if you've got these 30,000 or 20,000 features, most of those features are exactly these things, the neutral loss species, the salt addicts, the multiply charged species. And you want to try and uh, reduce that. What do we mean by adduct formation? So remember with, a, with mass spectrometry, we charge things. You'll get a positive or a negative charge. That's the parent ion. So here's one at 961 Daltons. But this one also has a sodium adduct. And in fact, the sodium adduct is much more intense. And there are many examples where a sodium or a lithium or a potassium adduct is the only peak you see. Um, you can also see the isotopomers, the uh, three or four extra peaks that come from this carbon-13 or deuterium. And these are examples of adducts. Um, um, these are also examples, again, this is a higher resolution mass spec, TOF, um, where you're taking, in this case, um, a real spectrum. Uh, we've taken the total ion chromatogram or our baseline, base peak chromatogram. We've got the extracted ion chromatogram in the bottom. And then from there, we're seeing the peaks. Um, and we can see the adduct, the sodium adduct. Uh, we can see the parent ion peak uh, from that. And then we can also see, I think, because there are two sodiums minus a hydrogen. So when you're working with biological samples, you've got sodium floating around, you've got potassium floating around, um, you have buffers that you might have prepared. Um, all of these have ions, um, and in this case it could be formate or acetate as well. Um, these are some of the adducts that will appear. So a given compound could have um, 10 or 15 other peaks all arising from simply the interaction of uh, ions, sodium, chloride, formate, uh, with your parent ion. Some of them a combination of multiple charges, single charges. Um, so this is one reason why you see so many peaks in a mass spectrum. Although Rafine has created a large list of adducts, and they've made that public. It uh, also allows you to calculate some of those masses. 
in mass spectrometry, you also get this phenomenon called neutral losses, where you, you lose the equivalent of a water or you lose the equivalent of a, a sugar. Um, those are peaks that don't necessarily show up because they're neutral fragments, but you will also see the fragments that are charged uh, that come from the loss of the water or the loss of a, a sugar. And again, these are simply, um, if you want, noise peaks. So handling or predicting adducts is an important thing, and, and many commercial programs actually support that. There are some uh, freeware programs like Metlin and MZDB and HMDB that do that. Um, Metlin and MZDB also handle uh, ion pairs and multiple charged species, and Metlin also does a nice job of handling neutral loss species. So when you're given a mass spectrum uh, from untargeted um, studies, you're going to have literally tens of thousands of features or peaks. And what you need to do is essentially identify and remove all those false positives or those adducts, the multiply charged species. You want to consolidate the neutral losses, the breakdown and rearrangement ones. You also want to get rid of those, all those isotope peaks because they are just essentially the same compound but just isotopomers. And in many cases you also have to deal with the blank uh, noise which comes from sample blanks just like with GCMS. Every time you run something through a column, stuff comes off. It wasn't part of your sample, but it's just stuff. Um, and there are different ways of uh, getting rid of those noise peaks, things that you know, only show up periodically or things that never dilute, no matter how much water or solvent you put through. So these are various approaches that help you get rid of it. So let's say you start with a positive ion mode spectrum. Let's say you see 15,000 features. It's usually what people report to impress everyone, say, my sample gave me 15,000 features. But once you get rid of the adducts, that 15,000 drops to 12. Once you move the multiply charged species, that drops from 12 to 10. Once you move the neutral loss fragments, that drops from 10 to 8. Once you remove the isotope features, that drops from 8 to 3. Once you remove the noise ones, you're down to 2,500 real peaks. So a drop by a factor of 5 or 6 or 7 is not unusual. And generally when you do it in a negative mode, negative ion mode, there's fewer peaks, even though you might again get 10,000 features. So if you did both positive and negative ion mode, you probably get maybe 4,000 useful consolidated peaks. And those are probably real compounds, of which about uh, 200 to 500 are probably identifiable. And the tools that use all of this, uh, as I said, there's some freeware programs that do this, but um, or partial this, but MZMine, MetFusion, Magma, and uh, XCMS are the ones that do that, along with commercial tools. Now, I've been discouraging this, but I'll, I'll bring it out, which is this the excitement over high resolution mass spectrometry, particularly with Orbi traps, uh, which give you one ppm or less, FTMS, which give you one ppm less, and even better, TOFM instruments are now down to one to two ppm. If you can measure a mass of a compound to five or six significant digits, that's really useful. Um, and there's some examples of how you can help with the identification process. And this is where you can take the, the mass and convert the mass to a chemical formula. Um, so there are some servers like MZDB that's maintained by Aberystwyth where you can type in your molecular weight to high accurate mass and indicate um, you know, both the charge and the type of um, uh, likely chemicals or elements that you're going to expect. In the case of living systems, it's just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, and not a whole lot more. So that restriction actually immediately reduces the types of compounds and feasible formulas that you're going to end up with. So if you've got a formula, then you can be somewhat more specific than a mass. So you can search various databases, including PubChem and HMDB and others by formula. But you can refine the formula even further from just the mass 
by using other things like the isotopic abundance. Remember when we saw that pattern with chlorine 37 and chlorine 35, how you saw a big peak and then a little peak and then another big peak? That's very characteristic of a chlorine. Um, there are also chemical bonding restrictions that say you can't have a, uh, a chemical that's you know C28H2. It just doesn't happen. Um, so using rules like Lewis and Senior rules that says, okay, this is a feasible uh, chemical formula and a feasible composition, you can come up with a, essentially a collection of, of, of viable formulas. And this was put together a number of years ago by Oliver Fien, and they called it the Seven Golden Rules, which have subsequently been incorporated in just about every commercial program to do formula generation or formula filtering. Um, and you can download uh, Seven Golden Rules as an Excel or Visual Basic pro program. Um, but it allows you to, to, to take essentially a raw mass spectrum and, and narrow things down. You can also take things from commercial <laughs> tools. This is a Brooker formula filter uh, program. And it says, you know, here are the possible formula sets we're going to have. And our input mass is 525 point something something. And you can see from that it's giving you about a half dozen feasible formulas based on... Um, the data that you've put into it. I'm not sure if this one actually is taking any isotopic abundance in there or not. Yeah. So the NC card gives you an idea of how well the isotopes behave in terms of ratio of the temperature and also distances between them. Okay. So this has been ranking it by the N sigma, which is essentially including the isotope one. And so this top one is probably uh, a very good match. Now, remember this is only a formula, and it's only working it from the single mass, high resolution mass. <coughs> so this is treading on very thin ice. Um, it's um, you're not using the tandem MS spectra, you're not using retention time, you're not using the authentic standard. So ideally, if you say, I think this is the compound, then you should go and pull out the authentic standard, uh, or what are possible authentic standards and see if you can get a, a match. However, still shrinking things down, if you think of all the possible formulas where you've got compounds made of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and phosphorus, there's 8 billion possible molecular formulas with different elemental composition. But if you use seven golden rules, that shrinks from 8 billion down to 600 million. And then if you look at the formulas that would match in PubChem, again, not necessarily the best database, but from 85 million compounds, when you can restrict it, uh, it, it only leads you with about 700,000 formula. Uh, and then if you start working with natural products from that set, suddenly you're reduced down to probably just 50,000, which means that in many cases you're only dealing with a few possible elements. Now, as you increase the size of a molecule, the number of possible um, chemicals also increases. So this is this general trend. As you go from 200 Daltons to 300 Daltons, you can see the number of, of possible molecular formulas climbs up almost linear from about 20 to about 80. So if you have a really big uh, molecule, then you could look at many, many possible ones. This is something that was also published by the Seven Golden Rules when they compared uh, how uh, better resolution improves the likelihood of a mass match and an exact formula. So a low resolution mass, low resolution data means you're going to have lots of possible formulas. If you can measure things down to 1 ppm or 0.1 ppm, even up to 7 or 800 Daltons, you've reduced it quite significantly. And then if you can use that uh, isotopomer distribution or isotopic distribution, then you can cut things down even more. So when you use mass and isotopic abundance, it's a powerful way of limiting likely um, candidates. It's not perfect, um, but it certainly has a powerful constraint on what the possible uh, chemicals could be. Now, as I say, this is the point I wanted to bring up again, which is when you use these large chemical databases like PubChem or Metlin or NIST, no one really tries to worry about whether they're 
natural products or metabolites. They're just simply chemical libraries. So they mix non-metabolites with metabolites, plant with insect, with microbial, drugs, buffer reagents, everything. And so this is leading to a growing trend, um, particularly with people using metlin, uh, getting essentially silly hits. They, just, they don't correspond to the biology of the organism. So if you know the source of the organism, if you can constrain things, then it would be better to, to, to use these. So if you know you're working with mammalian systems, use h &B. If you're working with drugs, work with a drug data bank. If you're working with plants, use knapsack. Or if you're working with E. coli or other microbes, use microbial-specific databases. Now in the last two minutes here, I'll just wrap up, but it, we're talking about quantification. So with LCMS, well, I haven't talked about it. With GCMS and, and NMR, we've talked about quantification, but most LCMS and many GCMS metabolomic studies don't use absolute quantification. To do absolute quantification, you have to, have to do isotopic dilution. You have to use isotopic standards, deuterium, carbon-13, or nitrogen-15 standards. Those ideally have to be the same compound, so N15-alanine, would use to be used to characterize alanine, or they have to be very close to that compound. You also use a technique called single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring when you're doing absolute quantification by MS um, to make sure that you're getting the exact compound. So this is done usually with triple quadrupole or linear ion trap in ant instruments. So multiple reaction monitoring means you have tandem mass spectrometers and you will have a, a Q1, and they'll call it the Q3, because the Q2 is used for the collision, um, signatures. And you're looking for a particular mass, a particular filter, and a particular uh, product ion. And so those are your signatures to positively identify the compound, and then you use the isotopic dilution method to actually help calibrate and figure out the quantity. So it's possible to do quantitation on your own if you've got the collection of standards, but you can increasingly now go to kit systems. Uh, Biocrates is one example of a company that produces kits. Uh, you can also get, I think, uh, systems from Shimadzu and um, I think a few others now. Uh, where they allow you to quantify uh, and do targeted absolute quantification of, of metabolites. So the P180 kit is a common one, um, and you can get uh, measures of sphingoma islands and positylcholines and lysopcs, and now it's up to like all 20 amino acids, a bunch of biogenic amines, and about 40 acyl carnitines. And so it's targeted. It's 186 compounds or thereabouts. Um, um, so it's not going to be as expensive or, or as thorough or complete as, say, uh, an untargeted analysis. But this is targeted quantitative metabolomics. Yes. How much? Cust you can't customize with it. So it's it's a kit that is set, and the same metabolites are measured all the time. Um, they have other kits. They have a bile acid kit. They have a steroid kit. Uh, you can go to other vendors like, I guess, Shimadzu, which will have a kit that's specific to their instrument. Um, in our lab, we, we make our own kits, um, and so we customize our assays as, as we wish. But we've had to spend lots of money um, acquiring standards. Um, Tammy has built a number of those kits, so if you guys want to know how to do that, she can tell you. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of work. Um, but the benefits are that it, it becomes very automated. Um, and, and that's largely what they do with the Biocrates, and that's the appeal. Just like basal is automatic, just like GC Autofit is automatic, these um, Biocrates kits are automatic. Load it up, go home, the results on your computer the next day. 
Um, so that's very appealing. And in the case of, of these MS kits, you can measure down to nanomolar all the way up to millimolar. Um, so it's an enormous range and concentrations you can detect. Um, so it's much more sensitive than, than NMR and, and much more sensitive than GCMS as a rule. Um, so it's quite appealing, uh, and a lot of people are using these, these targeted kits now in metabolomics. So LCMS both for targeted and for untargeted, but the vast majority of people still do untargeted uh, metabolomics via LCMS. Um, uh, which is challenging, as you guys will find out uh, later this afternoon. Mm -hmm.